Hi, welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures. Uh, we've covered a lot about lasers already, and we're now going to move into some of what it seemingly first seems to be the most mysterious part of a laser, the optical amplifier, the gain medium, but we'll soon learn really this is a fairly straightforward thing uh, based on stuff we already know. So just to review, uh, we have a laser cavity, which we know is stable because we've read chapter two. We know this cavity forms a beam of some type, um, and understanding the transverse modes of the beam or the shape of the beam, we learned in chapter five. Uh, once the beam's produced, we can calculate how it propagates even through optics because we read chapter three of our book. And we know that only certain frequencies are allowed in this cavity, and uh, these frequencies are given the name longitudinal modes. Um, so we know what frequencies the cavity is going to produce because we've read chapter six of our book. Really, the only thing that's left is understanding the optical amplifier to understand a laser. And here we go back, and we're assuming you understand a little bit about the energy levels of atoms and molecules, because this gain medium is going to, at some level, be constructed of atoms and molecules. Everything is. And say we have a crystal of glass or some other kind of transparent material, and inside that crystal we put particular atoms and molecules that have have favorable characteristics for a laser. Um, we know the atoms or molecules that are embedded in that crystal or of a gas or of a liquid, depending on the type of laser we want to build, have particular energy levels. And that's shown in this diagram right over here. Um, essentially what we have is we know that most of the electrons of these atoms are going to be in the ground energy level. And this energy level is going to defi be defined to have some kind of energy uh, defined to be zero. And that in is the total number of electrons in the ground state. So if we have something like a trillion atoms inside our gain medium, and 90% of them are in the ground state, then 900 billion atoms, or 900 billion electrons are in, are in the ground state overall. And in zero is something like 900 billion. Uh, some small fraction will be in a higher energy level with energy state E1 and the total number of electrons in that energy level of all the atoms that make up the material will be N1. And the same, we can define N2 and E2 and any number of energy levels we want to that we're interested in the system. Uh, we also know that if we sum up N0 plus N1 plus N2, that number is going to be the total number of atoms that are in our gain medium um, because the electrons have to be somewhere. If they're stuck inside the atom, they can't escape. And so they're going to be in one of these energy levels. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. But before we go on and discuss this, as we will for quite a while now, we need to review differential equations. Because differential equations essentially are the equations that tell us how electrons move around in these energy levels and, in fact, can create optical amplification. So let's take a look at a very simple system to review differential equations and understand how they work. And that system that we're going to talk about is a tank of water. And uh, for that purposes, let me go ahead and, and choose an Aquarian color here, uh, blue. And we're going to say that there's some volume of water inside a tank. And that water is leaking out of the tank very slowly, as shown in the figure over here. Um, and we know the volume of water is a function of time, because it's leaking, at, leaking out. But rather than write of t in my equation, I'm just going to represent v of t is v, and that's going to make the equations a little bit easier to follow. So let's see what we've got. If I want to know how much water is in the tank at some later time than right now, and the amount of laterness is defined by delta t, so we know the volume at some later time, v of t plus delta t, it's simply the amount of volume we have in the tank right now, v, minus the amount of water that leaks out. Well, how do we find, we define that amount of, of water that leaks out? Intuitively, we know that the amount of water that leaks out in some time, delta t, depends on the volume of water that's in the tank, because when there's a lot of water, it's going to be pushing very hard, and the leak's going to occur very quickly through this little hole we have. And let's draw a little hole there that the water's leaking out of. Um, so it depends on the amount of volume that's in the tank, and it also depends on the size of the hole. And I don't know exactly what that is, but I can say there's some constant k that represents the size of that hole. And if k is a big number, then the water is going to leak out very quickly. 
and a big K corresponds to a large hole. If the hole is very tiny, then my constant K is going to be small and the water is going to leak out more slowly. So the overall amount of water I lose in some time delta T is proportional to delta T. Delta T is large, I'm going to lose more water. If it's small, I'm going to lose less water. It depends on the amount of water I have in my tank because if there's a large volume, I'm going to lose more than if the tank is almost empty. And it depends on the size of the hole, which is some constant K. And in that case, if I want to know the change of volume of water, it's just the amount we have after minus the time we have now, and that's given by delta V. So the change in volume over some, some time delta T is simply delta V. Now, it just comes down to algebra. What I want to do in this case is some fairly simple substitutions. Essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to take by definition of V of T plus delta T, and I'm going to substitute it in right there, and I'm going to take this, and I'm going to substitute it in right there, and with that substitution, I see my V's essentially cancel out. And so delta V, the change in volume, is just given by this expression right here. And all I've done is some algebra. I've said the change in volume is simply how much volume there is, a constant proportional to the size of the whole, and the time that I let the water leak out. And the negative sign is because the volume is decreasing. We're getting less and less water in the tank as time goes on, as it leaks out. Well, now things are pretty straightforward. I just divide both sides by delta T, and I have a difference equation that says the change in water divided by the time that I measure is simply minus the volume times the size of the hole. And then in the limit that delta T approaches zero, this stops being an algebra equation, becomes a calculus equation. And I just changed my capital Greek letter delta to small Greek letter deltas, and voila. All of a sudden, I've gone from this simple argument to a differential equation. This is how differential equations are defined. It's important you understand how this is done, because we're going to be using differential equations a lot. And all we're trying to define with a differential equation is how the state of the system changes with time. And this, in fact, turns out to be the easiest of all possible differential equations to solve. And it has an equation that looks like this, where V sub naught is the amount of volume you have in your tank at time t equals zero. And it leaks out with this exponential form. And you can easily go ahead and convince yourself by plugging V back into this equation that this equality is, in fact, true and this is correct. Great. Uh, what does this have to do with lasers? Um, before we get into that, we need to look at how these differential equations would be applied to a more complicated system because rarely are we going to consider just an isolated tank with water leaking out. That's not very interesting, because after not too much time, you're going to have an empty tank, and that's no fun at all. So let's look at applying differential equations to a more complicated system, because this formality we've developed can be applied to very complicated systems very 